Okay, this lecture is about able sum and Poisson's kernel. And what is able sum? So here's the definition. So we're given a series of complex numbers. It's able summable to S if for any R we have defined AR to be this such that it converges. So it is able summable to S. And we also have this. So this as limit, we take R goes to 1, and this converges to S, which is the original sequence. Okay? This is the property of able sum. So here's a, a question about able sum. It's that to prove able sum ability is stronger than the standard Cesaro summation. So here, part A means that if a series of complex numbers comes to the final limit, then the series is able summable. So we have coverage in place, able summable. Okay. So here we analyze this partial sum. For CN, we use the substitution of this. And then some algebra gives this. Okay. Now we let n goes to infinity. But we want to make sure that this uh, series converges. So we analyze, we use the ratio test. Well, this, which is this. Well, the limit of this is equal to r, which is less than 1. So by ratio test, this series converges. Okay, so it converges to this. Well, because this part, well, Sn goes to 0, right? And Rn also goes to 0. So the series converges. Now, it converges some constant, right, times 1 minus r. I mean, if it converges, right, then you are bounded. You're bounded by a constant. So we let r goes to 1 from negative side, so this goes to 0, and this also goes to 0, okay? Well, there's something right here. So, <coughs> and we're equal to negative c times 1 minus r. Okay, because, I mean, this entire thing, we know that it converges, so it is bounded. I was bounded, we read out the statement here, because this thing is bounded, okay? Then we use the squeeze theorem. Okay, so, so this gives the result. So, convergence implies a bell uh, summable. Now, if s is non zero, we, we do this trick, okay? Now, for part B, it says that there exists a series uh, bell summable but does not converge. Okay, so the hint is like this. Well, if it's a bell summable but not converge, so we want to show this sequence. So we consider this series, which is this. Now, because this converges absolutely, right? Because r is less than 1, then we can insert parentheses and then we can we can rearrange we can add them up like separately okay so so some some algebra gives you this oh well, this goes to negative one over two but this series clearly diverges and part c is that cesaro summable then implies the bell summable so we use um use this hint okay so this hint <coughs> we do ratio test for this part, and this goes to R, which is less than 1, as n goes to infinity. So again, we let <coughs> R goes to 1 from the negative sign. So this goes to 0, so the sigma is non-zero, we give this. Okay, so now we move on to define, um, define ARF theta to be this thing. Given f theta has the Fourier uh, series representation, so um, this is called like a bill able able means of function. So able means of function is defined to be this. Okay, so these are all the same, but we have a r to the capital n. So this is really similar to our to our like right to our able sum. So notice that we if we define C0 to A0 and Cn is equal to this. Because this n is an absolute value, right? So we can group them. We can 
use the distributor bar, right? We can group them with this. Now, if we do this, then we see that it is equal to this. The series becomes this. Okay, just some note. I hope you guys note. And now, since we have f is integrable, which means that for any integer, the Fourier coefficient by definition equal to this, which is less than equal to this. Okay, so this is equal to one, so we don't think about it. We have this. Well, because f is bounded, right? So this entire thing is gonna be bounded. So a n is uniformly bounded for all integer n. And now we consider uh, the partials, partial sum of this. Okay, the partial sum. Well, it's less than equal to this, right? We just put absolute value sign inside. And because a n is uniformly bounded, we've got this. Now this thing also converges, right? So which converges. Which means that it is independent, oh, independent of the variable theta, right? So this converges uniformly in theta. Or by our definition, we said it converges uniformly by the wire uh, stress M test, right? M test. Mean this thing, right? It's less than equal to this. Okay. And note that we define the po Poisson's kernel to be like this. It's so given as an infinite sum. Okay. And the able sum is given like this, where a is the Fourier coefficient. Okay. Fourier is coefficient. Now we do some algebra, right? We put this inside, gives you this. And uh, yeah, that's the only thing we do here so far. And now we see that um, we put this inside, right? So we put everything inside and we pull one over two pi all the way outside. We got this. Now, notice these two, we can switch them, right? Because why, the thing inside Converges uniformly. Okay? The thing inside converges uniformly. Well, why? Mm. So we know that f is integrable, so this must be bounded, this must be bounded, and this, when you take the absolute value sign, is equal to 1, so the whole thing again becomes a series of this, which is uniformly in a variable phi and the theta, so it's variable in like. No matter which which symbol you choose to be a variable, they all converge uniformly. Well, in our case, is in phi, so that we can interchange this infinite sum and the integral. Okay, we can interchange them. So this drops this case, and for this, well, because we can pull this outside. Right, we can pull this outside. So let's. So you see that? Well, yeah. Like I okay. I'll just keep it like this. So if we pull this outside, and the thing inside is P R phi minus theta, right? Because this is phi minus theta. And the outside is F theta. So this is really just the convolution of f with a Poisson's kernel, okay? So the able sum of a function is the convolution of f with the Poisson's kernel. So this leads to the lemma. So we have proven this formula already. The Poisson kernel is a good kernel as r tends to 1 from below. Okay, so it's good kernel in the sense of r approaches the one negative. Usually we say it's a good kernel in the sense of n approaches infinity, but here it's in the sense of r approaches the one from a negative sign. Okay, so let's just verify. Let's just verify the third property, okay? Since this is equal to this by high school algebra, now for r between 1 over 2 and 1 and theta, 
we have first this part is non-negative right and this thing this is greater than equal to one so it's greater than this and one minus cos theta well you're between delta and pi right so pi so one minus cos theta is increasing right so it's greater than some constant c delta depends on the delta so you put it back so the whole thing is greater than some c delta which is positive so we substitute back with an inequality we got p the poisonous kernel is less than or equal to something okay now if we integrate this well we can change this to negative pi to pi less than or equal to negative pi to pi and this thing is less than or equal to some c delta times 1 minus r squared. Now we let r approaches to 1 from the negative sign, which gives the result. This is not negative. I mean, this could be less than epsilon for all epsilon, so this goes to 0. Now, since all the portions are uh, non negative, okay, you just, you just take a look and observe it. Well, what if, what if r is greater than 0, less than 1 over 2, greater than 0? Okay, so this thing is still non-negative, but this thing will greater than some constant c times this, okay? Because this is no longer greater than or equal to 1, but still you're greater than some constant, right? Well, if it's 0, if it's 0, then everything's just 1. Right, so oh, so if r is positive but less than one over two, then this thing is still greater than equal to this thing is still greater than some two r times c delta. Okay, so I can bring a two r here. Now, as r goes to 1, we still get the desired result, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so actually, this should be on the top, but it is a constant, so it doesn't really matter that much. Can, as long like this is a constant, okay? And here below, we have 2r, right? Or if you just let r goes to 1, it doesn't matter at all. And since they're all not negative, so we just need to verify A. And A, like we just substitute this, and we have uniform convergence, we interchange the order, and we do some regroup. Well, which gives that this thing, okay, this thing is just, well, if it's non neg non zero, like we talked about this last lecture, right? And the zero is like the case is 2 pi. So this thing all goes to zero which gives you 1 because 2 pi cancels out, okay? So Poisson's kernels are good kernels. So combined with theorem 2.1, which is the approximation to identity theorem, gives theorem um, 5.6, which is a Fourier series, and you're function on a circle, at able sum over to f. What does it mean by able sum over to f? Is that this goes to, goes to f, which is able summable, okay? Which is able summable to f. And if f is continuous on a circle, it's a uniform loop, okay? So here, um, it's, a, it's a theorem, like, integral function on a circle, then used to find this is Poisson kernel convolution, then we have, first is that u has two continuous derivatives, and two is that this uniformly converges to f theta. And the third one, I'll just skip it, because I didn't do I didn't know a partial derivatives, okay? I mean, partial differential equations. I didn't learn that, so I just skipped that part. So, let's do property two first. So this is really just this. Well, this converges f theta when theta is continuous, okay? By the approximation to identity. So that's a very important theorem. So the first one, <coughs> well, this is kind of, extra okay now 
u r theta is equal to this because we have uniform convergence so we can differentiate them term wise okay it's like by my my walter rudin's lecture right if you have uniform convergence and you can interchange the order of taking derivative and taking limits okay so the partial derivative just differentiate it term wise and also second derivative similar for this okay so this really just concludes this uh, lecture so the Fourier coefficients we come to summary the Fourier coefficients we define it like this in the series for a series trig polynomials define like this and our proof of uniqueness is that if they have the same coefficients then and they are two pi periodic then they're equal for fg continuous f theta naught okay so if they're both continuous then they agree they all have the same Fourier coefficients then these two functions are equal okay and also if the series converges absolutely or f is c2 then we all have the the Fourier series converges to the function uniformly okay uniform convergence given that absolute convergence and uh, c2 functions okay and we define convolutions right we define convolutions and then we uh, we investigate properties of convolutions and which leads to good kernels which this important theorem is that f the convolution of f in a good kernel converges to the function uniformly and we have say, talk about the year and poisons kernels are good kernels but the Rishlake kernels is not a good kernel okay so i see you guys next time